hello everybody we should start again hopefully people have grabbed a, a cup of tea um and are ready to go um we now have our keynote uh speaker bill kovacic who welcome bill who is global competition oh, hi global competition professor of law and policy at george washington law uh, in dc um now, many of you will know Bill very well for his kind of unrivaled experience and analytical thinking around competition law. You may not have heard him speak so much about consumer law, but as a, as a fellow non-executive director at the CMA and also a former chair of the FTC, he also has huge relevant knowledge in that space too. And as I'm sure you all know, he's a wonderful speaker. So I will, with that, I will just hand you over. Thank you, Amelia. I'm just going to pull up some uh, some slides to, to share here. I'm thrilled to be part of the program and I'm very grateful to, to Sean for the invitation and Amelia for the opportunity to do this, uh, especially in light of, of what the, the CCP has done over the years. I, I see three admirable features of its work that I want to draw upon today. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary commitment from early days when Catherine and Morton created the center uh, to focus on a multidisciplinary point of view that drew together a variety of relevant disciplines. Uh, it's focus on evaluation and it's uh, respect for case studies as a way of developing public policy precedents that can inform policy making. Uh, and it's uh, commitment to be a genuine resource for policymakers to advance what Malcolm Sparrow referred to as the regulatory craft. Uh, this afternoon, I want to talk about one experiment with policymaking in the consumer protection privacy area uh, as a way of touching upon themes uh, that the panelists have raised so far uh, to connect the presentation to those themes and to talk about a significant US experiment in policymaking in this realm. This is joint work with David Hyman, and I'm giving you my views, not those of the CMA, but Certainly my experience in the CMA informs my thinking about this, especially questions of policy integration. I wanna talk about the do not call rule as the, the prototype uh, of policy making here uh, and to focus on a couple of specific themes. One, the choice of a conceptual principle for intervention, uh, the use of opting in as a mechanism for implementation, uh, and the problems that arise with uh, adaptation, especially here by business enterprises, and to identify a couple of other frontiers for innovation that involve the integration of competition and consumer protection. Uh, the FTC's do not call rule is uh, promulgated in 2003. It is a rulemaking. This is uh, primary legislative uh, regulation making. Uh, it allows citizens to sign up for a registry that precluded telemarketers from calling them unless they gave their consent. Uh, and calls to registered individuals are prohibited. There were a few exceptions in the rule with fines uh, for each in, in infringement. The first interesting question is the basis on which uh, intervention is premised. And we've had a discussion uh, over the past day and a half about different conceptual bases for doing this. That is, do you borrow competition law concepts involving exclusion or exploitation. Uh, some notion of unfairness, which Christine discussed, uh, deception as a basis for intervention. Uh, Bruce's concept of hindering. The approach used in the do not call rule was what was called abusiveness. This was an extension of traditional FTC enforcement beyond notions of economic harm. And in a fundamental way, uh, what uh, abusiveness seeks to protect is individual dignity, uh, individual autonomy. It was not linked to a concept of uh, market power that is the relevant actors covered, could be a small telemarketer or a large telemarketer. And the very specific harm to be addressed was the unwanted intrusion in the home of telephone calls, especially in the evening hours. Uh, the 
economic cost or disturbance associated with answering a telephone call when you're having dinner uh, arguably is relatively trivial. Uh, the disturbance to one's routine, one's autonomy, uh, arguably is significant. And the irritation it causes is great. Uh, I think the do not call rule is interesting in the way in which it recognized a concept of harm infringement that goes beyond the traditional approaches of unfairness, deception, or an unfair method of competition, which had been the previous bases on which the FTC intervened. The notion of abusiveness would have broader application, I'd argue, in the development of a regime governing privacy or other consumer protection interests. Uh, the second is that it relies on opting in. That is, citizens had to register. Uh, why opting in? First, there was a constitutional mandate that caused the FTC to be cautious in deciding how the state could interpose itself to filter commercial speech. And there was a Supreme Court decision involving postal services in 1970, in which the Supreme Court had upheld a, me upheld a mechanism in which the postal service, on behalf of an individual postal customer, could filter out certain types of speech, in this case, pornographic material. The court emphasized that it was the individual who was asking the postal service to act on its behalf. It wasn't the postal service imposing the control without that kind of citizen request. And it also emphasized that it was meant to prevent intrusions into the household, uh, to keep unwanted material from being put through the mail slot. Another reason for opting in is that the FTC had a lot of confidence that consumers would opt in. Uh, there had been a large volume of citizen complaints that identified the intensity of individual user preferences. And there had been a limited amount of state experience with prototypes of a do not call rule that were also studied carefully as a way of providing a sense of confidence that citizens would opt in given the choice. Uh, three key questions in implementation that were considered in advance. One is technical feasibility. Uh, that is the registration mechanism, which operated online, operated through more traditional telephone call registration, was a major challenge. Uh, uh, the FTC had a technical team inside to assess how this might work, and this was quite crucial. In the 1990s, a major investment was made in building up a technical team, mainly to work on the consumer side of the agency, but helped ensure the development of a mechanism that would handle the volume of calls. The initial prediction was on the first day, there might be a thousand every minute, turned out to be 10,000 a minute, but the system was robust enough to handle this. Uh, there was political risk. There was significant legislative support, but there was a strong industry lobby that worked at each end uh, to stop the implementation of the rule. And there were legal risks. Would this legal concept of opting in ultimately be, be acceptable? Um, I'm, this is Lois Greisman. Lois is the person more than anyone else who was responsible for implementation. Lois had been at the agency for 25 years. She was well versed in the law and policy of the agency. And she is exactly the kind of experienced person who was able to put this together and carry it out. Um, I don't think Lois probably is well known globally. There is not a consumer protection agency around the world that should not know her name. Uh, if there were a hall of fame of great professionals who took risky, difficult projects and made them more, Lois is one of them. Lois is still at the FTC. She is as commendable and remarkable a civil servant I've ever met. Uh, a next consideration, though, is accounting for adaptation. This was David's point on the first panel on the first day. The initial success of the do not call rule was extraordinary. Hundreds of millions of people registered their phone numbers. There was broad public satisfaction. FTC employees going to larger public gatherings would get standing ovations because they had brought some measure of peace to the dinner time. But there was user adaptation, the rise of mobile telephony, raised questions about how the principle of protecting the home would deal with individuals who didn't have any hesitation to make phone calls in crowded public areas where we've all gotten to share the intimate details of the lives of others uh, in close proximity. But the other was adaptation by the companies. And this was the blind spot. 
they looked at the rule and they bypassed it with robotic calling that became much more difficult to detect and, inter and intercept. Um, and a key question for regulators that this underscored, I think, was how to anticipate and test this. Uh, the FTC arguably should have had more technologists on the team to engage in the process that an adversary squadron does, testing the limits and effectiveness of the existing rule, and Ted anticipating how companies will adapt and seek to bypass, and how the rule might be revisited on a fairly regular basis when its operation is sensitive to these kinds of technological adaptations to think about how it might be adapted in order to make it effective. Over time, the robotic calling became a serious gap in the effective functioning of the rule. It means that evaluation has to be a crucial element of policy integration. That is uh, Fiona's point about competition, consumer protection, economics. Uh, the larger points made throughout the presentations about the examination of past experience. Uh, I'm going to mention a couple of other rules that could be suitable subjects for examination, but I think in thinking about institutional design, uh, it, it underscores how a natural element of the life cycle of regulatory intervention has to be evaluation and how agencies can value enormously from learning and past experience. Uh, in the modern era about uh, whether or not you want to integrate more deeply in principle, different functions into an agency, the FTC, as far as I know, is the world's only agency that combines all three of these disciplines. Arguably, in doing good regulation in the area, that's a good combination. How well does it work, work in practice? Uh, can you combine competition and consumer thinking in building good rules? I'll give you two examples to say that the answer is yes. Uh, in 1971, the FTC adopted a trade regulation rule governing octane rating. It required a disclosure. It's that string of numbers you see in the middle of the picture. On Oren's part about whether disclosure can be understood, um, the glorious simplicity of the disclosure here is that the required information consisted of a two-digit number that told you whether or not the octane and the gasoline being dispensed was suitable for your engine and would provide you with good care. 87 for the lowest unleaded regular, up to 91 for premium. And due to a process of conversation with engine manufacturers, the FTC had confidence that if you told people to put those two digits on the pump, it would be enough. I'm not aware of a larger study that has tried to measure the competitive effect of this. Uh, how much did this inspire competition among gasoline retailers with respect to price, quality. You can put in other additives, but that's simplified disclosure at its best. And the rule rested on both a sense of competition and consumer protection. And the last is eyeglasses. Uh, the FTC adopted a rule in the mid 1970s that said that doctors could give you upon request a copy of your prescription. A number of states had disallowed this before. Um, this was styled as a consumer protection rule, but it had enormous competition implications. Uh, it relied on a study of experience in member states. It had the controls on providing the prescription and those that did, did, did not. The rule had tremendous pro-competitive economic effects with respect to prices and most important of all, innovation. Uh, the astonishing innovation with respect to lenses and to the frames that you can buy today all related to the development of the rule, which again was premised on both consumer protection, give consumers access to the information, but competition as well, having some sense of what might be done. So I finish with a, a tribute to the conference itself, uh, the extent to which the academic hub can provide the basis for, uh, for integrating modern research into the policymaking mainstream but also it's uh, admirable emphasis on going back and looking at what you've done before as a way of looking ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Bill, for this excellent lecture that, that exactly uh, matched what we were expecting from you when we were discussing inviting you, uh, and then we're giving some very clear and concrete insights, and at the same time really drawing in everything what uh, speakers before you have have said on the topic. Uh, so thank you very much for that. That was 
that was actually brilliantly summing up and Thanks, also the wonderful, wonderful uh, introduction uh, to our final panel, which I have the honor of chairing. Um, and uh, so I'm, I wasn't observing Amelia's role. She was just, uh, so to speak, um, uh, changing um, her, uh, changing into the role of, of being a panelist and, and me doing the panel. Um, we have for this final panel, uh, really a, a great group uh, of speakers as well. I just want to briefly intro introduce them um, before um, I say a couple of things about how we're how we're going to uh, proceed with the panel. Uh, let me start with George Lusty, uh, who is Senior Director for Consumer Protection at the Competition and Markets Authority. So someone who's, who's actually doing this work and, and has had some experience on it. On the consumer protection side, uh, Augustin Reyna, who, okay, I, I didn't see on my panel up here because you're on the next, <laughs> next page over. Uh, welcome, Augustin, to, to this panel as well. Um, he is the Director of Legal and Economic Affairs at the European Consumer Organization, BUC, and so uh, it comes at this very much from uh, the, the consumer agency side. Um, Grant Saggers, uh, who heads the NERA uh, office in London, uh, uh, is, is a speaker out of private practice. Um, no surprise, he will have a lot to say about litigation in this, uh, on this. Um, John Fall, who is a uh, chair of the European Public Affairs at Brunswick Group, uh, but previously with a long career at the European Commission, um, a long time at DGCOM, uh, where he was also deputy director general and then in several director general positions on uh, justice and, and um, single market uh, for many years at the European Commission. Um, Last but not least, Amelia Fletcher, who I don't need to introduce because she's been doing this over this conference uh, by herself. Um, and let us kind of start with this panel. Now I'm gonna be, um, I, I hope as a, as a chair for the panel um, and, and, and kind of a moderator, um, a little bit of thorn in the side um, of the speakers uh, in the sense of trying to ask some critical questions. I think all of them would, um, uh, are, are very excited about thinking about new directions to go on consumer policy. Um, I, will, I will ask lots of questions on uh, what makes sense, what may, might not make sense. I know all of them uh, love to talk as we've heard a lot about today as well on digital issues. But um, as we've talked about this, I, I think um, it would be really nice to start, first of all, with a bit of a look back at what we've done in the past and what we know about how well we've done. And, and I think uh, it would be really great, George, for you to give us their kind of a first overview on this. Um, so what, what have we done in traditional uh, consumer policy? Um, Bill just gave us a, a brilliant example of the do not call rule. Um, I, I can also tell, kind of, at, at least in the UK, that robocalls are getting around it. Uh, we're, we're seeing a lot of fraudulent calls as well, um, where you're being told that the um, that the tax authorities are, are going to sue you and, and all the likes. Um, where have we seen successes? Where have we seen failures? And how much do we actually know about how well we've done? Uh, and that's something I'm particularly interested in because um, when I was at the European Commission, I, I kind of started the first uh, exposed analyses of mergers. And as you've heard from Bill, uh, the CCP is very high on exposed analyses. Um, so what do we do in, about this? Long question, George, but I think um, as a summary and a start for this discussion, uh, probably a good starting point. Thanks very much. And I'll, I'll try and answer as much of it as I can. And I suppose if we're looking at how well we've done in traditional uh, areas of consumer policy before we get to our later discussion on digital. I'd say that the last 15 months have tested that pretty acutely. Um, there have been all manner of consumer protection issues arising linked to the pandemic, particularly widespread cancellations of services, holidays in particular, but also childcare, weddings, holiday lets uh, and the rest. 
and I'm pleased to say in that context that consumer law has done pretty well actually we've been able to pursue those issues directly faced by consumers which stem from unfair or overreaching contract terms from misleading statements for example about consumers entitlements when they travel and the protections that they should be afforded and we've been able to get outcomes we've been able to use tools like the new enhanced consumer measure power to get redress and put money back in people's pockets and the CMA does much wider work across traditional marketplaces and this week we announced a good outcome on the sold property mis-selling and again the the traditional consumer law has stacked up it's allowed us to challenge unfair ground rent escalation terms and to tackle the broad mis-selling of leasehold homes that occurred over the start of, um, uh, of, of the noughties. When it comes to that question about evaluation, I think also the last 15 months is perhaps one of the best examples of that. Um, now, normally the CMA relies very heavily on landscape partners like Citizens Advice and other uh, uh, advice bodies in the home nations to gather intel to tell us what's going on uh, and we can look at that, dive into it as enforcers and work out what we should take on. Now, such was the volume of pandemic related harm that we decided to set up our own direct uh, web form to collect data and information from the public. And so in real time, we were going through that, looking which sectors, which businesses were being flagged as problematic. Now, these were obviously complained about issues rather than the hidden areas of a consumer detriment, but on issues like pricing, on cancellation and refunds, on broadly unconscionable and unfair behavior, we were hearing about that. And we could target our enforcement action about those most complained about firms and then see what impact it had. And another virtue of the enhanced consumer measure powers is that you can control the specific outcomes, the, the redress, but the, the way in which firms engage with their consumers, the CMA can mandate that they contact consumers in particular ways, that particular information is displayed on websites, that they get contacted with a certain number of days, and likewise monitor that refunds are being paid by the due deadlines. So we'd have, particularly in this sort of this, this, this uh, live experiment of the pandemic, I think been able to respond well, but there are many, many areas of harm in traditional areas, in offline areas. And sadly, from all of my experience of enforcing over the past years, when we go to businesses, they are not tripping over themselves to hand over their consumer law compliance policies uh, to tell us about how they train their staff or that they have conducted an end-to-end -end review of the customer experience to make sure that it meets the basic requirements of consumer law. We've seen businesses pop up during the pandemic that have no terms and conditions, that have completely imbalanced terms and conditions. And sadly, where there is increasing sophistication in the digital space, uh, and you know, through data breaches and other uh, uh, issues that come up, we're also seeing a huge impact in the offline world as scams get more and more sophisticated and they're more authentic and credible and believable because of the data gathered about the individual and the level of fear that uh, scammers and others are able to instigate. Um, so that's a, that's a broad overview. I hope that's a helpful starting point. I think that's a helpful starting point. And maybe anybody else who wants to jump in, I would I would maybe ask Augustine, but but anybody who, who would like to ask that question as well. Do we kind of also have, what have we learned about interventions that don't work very well? So. If I'm thinking about kind of requirements um, when I'm trying to buy something over the telephone and before I can even ask, I get a, a long, very quickly uh, read down um, legal disclaimer that I can hardly follow. Uh, that seems to be no, not much different from what I'm clicking away uh, on the internet. Um, Bill was talking about the simplicity of the interventions that is really important. Um, where, where, where do you see failures kind of in, in the interventions and in the instruments that we're using in order uh, to resolve issues? Thank you. Thank you, Kay. I'm uh, actually very happy to be, to be joining you today. I hope the next time we can do it in Norwich as <laughs> we should. Um, so I, I need to totally agree with you, George. Uh, I think if you look at the last 
you know, 30 years, basically, of EU consumer law. Um, I think this is one of the EU policy areas that have contributed the most to people's daily lives. Um, just think about very simple things, <laughs> talking about simple intervention, guarantee rights. This is simply didn't exist in the past. And it's because of the integration process and the establishment of a single market that um, today, you know, people have a very pretty decent um, framework on legal guarantee rights. When in the past, in some countries, you, you don't even have six months <laughs> of guarantee. So today you have a minimum of uh, two years uh, across the EU. And, and I listed many examples, unfair contract terms, um, the unfair commercial practices directives. There are a lot of instruments that have really contributed to, to make Europe basically one of the best places in the world to live as a consumer. Now, of course, it has the limitations. I think one of the areas that we are realizing where um, better can be done is when it comes to mandating disclosure. Um, for example, the, unfair, the um, contract terms directive, which was negotiated and, and reviewed um, uh, in 2011 and more, more recently with the modernization directive, uh, still um, the, 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 the intervention technique is information disclosure, but we're seeing the limitations of that and we're going to talk later, for example, when it comes to dark patterns and, and the use of misleading um, user interface. I think another area where um, we are not yet there, it's when it comes to enforcement particular enforcement of, of consumer laws. This has to do with the fact that due to member states' procedural autonomy, um, enforcement is largely done at a national, national level. Not all countries have authorities who are equipped with the resources to be able to um, intervene in this market. Let's not forget that there is no um, EU requirement to have independent consumer authorities. We have that, for example, for competition authorities, for media authorities, data protection authorities, but not for consumer authorities. And, and here, I think that plays an important role because in, in the countries where we have more active consumer authorities are those where the competition authority has also the consumer protection powers. Um, so I think that is I think, an area also to reflect about how to make the enforcement more efficient. And another very important challenge has to do with the fact that many of the companies uh, that operate across, across the EU are, are infringing you know, consumer law. But again, we don't have an European response. Now we have the, the Consumer Protection Cooperation Network, actually, that can, and the idea is to streamline more that enforcement. But um, this has been only in, in, in place for, um, for a very short period of time. So we really need to see how this is going to play out in practice. Um, so I think a lot can be learned from, I'm sorry, um, the limitations of the, of the current framework. And, but I think that we have a very good basis uh, to, to start. So I was, I was, I absolutely agree with all of that. I think that um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on the disclosure point. I think that one of the things that we've been doing a lot more of, Bill was talking about the need for ex post evaluation, and I think there has been more of that. But I think there's also been lots more ex ante testing of interventions, uh, particularly kind of informational nudge or other types of nudge interventions, uh, often by the regulators as much as the consumer um, authorities, although also in consumer policy. And I think that that combined with the greater thinking about behavioral economics as Fiona was highlighting, um, has made us realize just how poor um, disclosures often are. They are absolutely necessary for good de consumer decision-making, but they are very far often from sufficient. Um, and indeed they can, in fact, sometimes even make things think things worse. So, I mean, you mentioned Kaive having something blaring at you down the phone and you just kind of ignore it. Actually, ignoring is one thing. Um, as Oren highlighted yesterday, actually disclosures can make your decision making worse if, for example, there's information overload and it makes you, yeah. you know, you, or if actually there's, it, it puts the wrong thing in front of you and leads you to ignore actually what you should be worried about. So I think this greater focus on empirical assessment of uh, any sort of intervention is really, really valuable. Um, but it does make, I think, me at least, feel much more nervous about where we were in consumer policy a little more, which was let's 
let's disclose and then leave it up to consumers and caveat emptor then applies. I think increasingly we realize that that isn't really sufficient. And I think that is already somewhat represented in consumer law. So we have the unfair contract terms rules, which recognize that consumers are not going to look at all that small print. And we have the, um, the laws around unfair commercial practices, which recognize that disclosures can be misleading. But I think that yet you know this is really the growth area for me um even apart from the digital side is really thinking further about really how consumers behave and whether we need to do more beyond just disclosure and when we disclose being much more careful to have disclosures that are really going to change the dial rather than kind of massive book loads of disclosures that that basically do nothing all right, maybe, maybe I can I can kind of get on to some some very closely related questions, um, and and I wanted to ask Jonathan about this because I think um, th this kind of insight about um, just disclosure is enough. It's not just information. Uh, kind of goes a little bit contrary to what what economists have always thought about as as kind of consumer policy being about asymmetric information uh, and competition policy being about market power. Um, but does that mean that we need to use other criteria or is information still something that's key, but it's the question of, you know, how do I convey information? Uh, is it the difference between complexity and simplicity or is information the wrong approach and we have to think about fairness and, and other criteria uh, and which? Well, thank you and hello everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. These are very important issues. I think Amelia is right that you know, the very existence of uh, unfair contracts legislation shows that the past was sold a long time ago. It is no longer, uh, uh, if it ever was appropriate, simply to say uh, you, uh, you provide information and the, uh, the buyer bewares. Uh, that that went a long time ago, if it was ever uh, a completely valid consideration. We all know the uh, speed it up uh, uh, warnings you get at the end of adverts, uh, and uh, particularly in Europe, the bewildering uh, ingredients and warnings, which have to be reasonably enough in dozens of languages for obvious reasons, uh, where uh, uh, it's very hard to find your own language and understand what you're about to ingest. So that's that's all perfectly right. Um, I'm old enough to remember when I started out in the competition game back in the 1970s, uh, I was told and taught uh, that there was competition law and policy and there was unfair competition law and policy. And these were completely different things. Uh, dealt with by different people, by different DGs in the commission, and in good old DG4, which the veterans among you will remember was DG Competition's original name when we did numbers, um, we did competition and fairness was um, something that was for other people to deal with. Yes, the word sort of cropped up in Article 86, 102 for the youngsters, uh, and uh, but we never really understood it. Um, and fairness was something that we left to other people, I don't know, philosophers, moralists to worry about. Life isn't fair. Competition is about markets. Uh, and as long as enough, there's enough competition among uh, producers and a little bit of concern about distributors, then uh, customers will be happy. Now, that was never, of course, fully true. And I'm exaggerating for, uh, for these purposes, but it's certainly no longer true today. Um, but I'm not sure we've made much more, at least we lawyers now, philosophers, others have to help, uh, uh, behavioral economists as well. I'm not sure we have made much progress in understanding what fairness and unfairness actually mean uh, in this context and what the role of the state and what the role of regulators should be uh, in, uh, in bringing it about. Uh, the role of state and regulators is um, a, a cultural thing as well, which, again, I'm exaggerating for these purposes, seems to divide 
uh, Europeans uh, from Americans. I often say, and I, I saw it happen, uh, the, the reaction to Twitter's and Facebook's ban of President Trump after the Capitol insurgency. Uh, uh, all my American friends, essentially on both sides of the political divide, uh, thought that whatever they thought of the decision, it was an appropriate way to decide that issue. Europeans, frankly, from Angela Merkel downwards, all reacted by saying, hang on a minute, this is not for private companies to decide. Uh, it, it's the president of the United States. But even if it is Joe or Josephine public, this is not a matter that we can leave in the hands of corporations. This has to be a matter uh, for uh, public policy and for the state. Now, the obvious retort to that is, well, if you want the state to do it, the state had better set out rules pretty quickly. It's been talking about doing this for the ever since the digital revolution started. It doesn't seem to be working very well. What do you expect companies to do um, if you haven't provided the appropriate framework? So these are, I think, very, very big issues. Um, I, I'll leave you with one final thought, and I, I really don't know the answer myself. Is it the case that the digital revolution is such a big paradigm change that nothing that went before is particularly helpful? Uh, and in both of these areas, competition and regulatory policies, uh, we have to think anew. I tend to think it's not the case um, and we shouldn't jettison the past entirely while thinking about the future. A final related thought, um, vertical control of supply chains, suddenly back in fashion. Uh, as a result of uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, and the legitimate concern about supply chains, but also because of the growing ESG uh, requirements that companies who end up providing consumer products to the final consumer uh, take responsibility for what went on in the a supply chain which supply chain which led up to the final product companies are now beginning to say well all right if you want me to take responsibility including legal responsibility liability therefore for my final product or service you've got to let me have more control of my supply chain than traditional competition policy uh, uh, has allowed me to do so far i leave the thought in your mind um Thank you. That, that was very interesting. And I, I kind of want to kind of spin off a question from that uh, really to Grant at this point, because um, you were saying, look, lawyers haven't haven't gotten a lot of grips to criteria like fairness. Um, I'm not quite sure where the economists have and if we have to evaluate kind of what outcomes are or, or kind of how to benchmark the rules. Uh, that's relatively difficult. And I, I kind of found also this example fascinating about the question you know, what we, we're very often telling firms now, um, they should be policing what goes on, for example, in their platforms. Um, and Jonathan, um, interestingly, uh, also said, well, um, they then answer, well, what are actually the rules that you want? Because just saying you need to police and we'll find out afterwards what it is, is also problematic. Um, Grant, what do you see? I mean, you your work has a lot to do with, with kind of, proving things or measuring them, uh, right? Where, when you hear these discussions about what kind of these standards should be, uh, uh, are there things you worry about um, in, in, in our implementation as we're broadening our perspective? Uh, thank you very much, Kay, and thank you very much to the CCP team for an amazing conference. Um, from my side as an economist, and I can only speak as an economist, it's been a fantastic uh, last decade as uh, you know, behavioral economics and experiments have taken off. Uh, and there's been a much greater focus with the arrival of lots of data on doing good analysis and doing a good econometrics and doing nice experiments. Uh, sadly, it's also taught us to be very humble uh, about what actually works and what doesn't work and what one would expect to happen. Um, 
we heard yesterday about some of the discussions how nudges might appear to have big effects in the short run, but they dissipate very quickly. Um, we've seen in a number of social sciences, but in behavioral economics as well, the challenges of maybe publication bias, uh, gearing us to think that certain behaviors or biases will have a more prevalent effect than they actually will. And that's because the papers that make their way into the journals historically have often been the ones that found an effect when all of those cases that didn't find an effect were left on the uh, drawing room floor. Um, and so for that reason, I think economists have had to become more humble. It's a very exciting time. There's lots of data to play with. But I do think that there are you know, two things that I'd like to point to about the history. One, we have been thinking about these things for a long time. I mean, Amelia uh, has, uh, you, you know, was uh, chief economist of the Office of Fair Trading. Fairness was in the title. She did her first very good paper on behavioral economics and competition policy in 2010, I think, was the first publication there. The FCA has done a huge amount of work, and I truly respect the way that they publish both the good and the bad examples, both the, pop, you know, the interventions that worked, but also the ones that actually, frankly, didn't work, and they disclosed that to get over that publication bias issue. Um, we have been thinking about it for a long time, but we are still struggling, and you don't see many cases being taken on even some of the most egregious abuses that excessive pricing, discriminatory treatment or pricing. And that's because these things are really hard to get to. Um, you know, it is unfair to treat different, uh, the same customer customers differently, but it's also unfair to treat different customers in the same way. And that introduces a challenge for, for companies because do you want to give the more active customers a better deal as they have revealed? Or don't you? And this is, I think, where George mentioned, um, you know, he doesn't often, I bet, get to see uh, very sophisticated and detailed internal policy documents. But I'm, I do think that in the private sector, a lot of folks think about that, certainly in financial services with the focus that the FCA has put on treating customers fairly. Um, there has been a great deal of thinking on it. Getting to the answers, though, is, is tricky. I think the fact that very few cases have come through proving even some of the most egregious abuses is interesting and it is a challenge for enforcers. It's certainly going to be a challenge for making sure that customers are left whole at the end of everything. Kayuba, I'll finish uh, at the end of this talk about litigation. But let me pause there to say, I think economists have had to learn to be humble, um, but we've got lots of work to do. Yes, um, thank you for that. I, I think, Augustine, I, I want to get back to you as well, because there's, there's something around, uh, around as well that also sounds very attractive, but I'm kind of wondering whether it's, it's generating these concerns even more. Uh, this is in the area of privacy, um, where, where I think generally the question of what is privacy, what are good privacy standards, uh, what are actually the negative effects and so on, it's much harder to, to actually pin down. And so things like privacy as a right seem to sound very attractive. The question is, can we handle that in practice? It's a very good um, um, question. It, it, it sounds attractive and it is a right. <laughs> so we kind of forget <laughs> about that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think the, the last years have been um, quite interesting discussion about um, to what extent competition agency needs to take into account uh, privacy as a competition parameter, all this type of discussion, which, fair enough, yes, it can be a competition parameter. But what we cannot forget, at least from the point of view of, um, of, of EU law, that complying with the GDPR is not a competition parameter. That's a minimum um, framework, minimum level of protection that every single company is expected uh, to respect. And from that perspective, what is really interesting is to see how data protection law, for example, interacts then with other pieces of law. There have been a lot of focus on the interplay with um, competition law, particularly regarding, for example, these digital mergers that um, have taken place in the last in the last years, the Bundeskantelam case on, on Facebook as well, 
very relevant for um, uh, one or two exploded tube abuses, uh, but they perhaps have not been too much attention on the interplay with consumer policy and consumer law. And what is, what is interesting is that consumer protection and data protection law actually serve different objectives or have different objects of protection, but they share a lot of principles and, and, and common concepts. Consumer law is about fair contracting. Data protection law is about fair processing. Um, consumer law is about informed choices. Data protection law is about informed consent. So there is a lot of commonalities between these two areas um, uh, of law. And, and here what we are seeing our witnesses more and more, it is merging or convergence of laws. Um, and we can evidence that through the enforcement. For example, um, one of the first cases of just before, after the, the GDPR for example, was, was adopted, um, still member states need to designate who were the eligible um, entities to bring cases. Um, in Germany, our German member, um, the, the, the Federal um, uh, Organization for Consumer Organizations, um, they were not designated yet as uh, eligible uh, party to bring GDPR cases, but that didn't stop them to bring same, the same cases on, on very similar grounds under consumer law. And we have actually several cases on unfair contract terms applied to um, privacy policies which actually led to a very similar outcome. Now at the end, they have been designated and they can bring GDPR cases. But what was really interesting is how you could actually use consumer protection instruments to achieve a very similar uh, outcome than um, consumer, consumer law enforcement, um, data protection law enforcement. So I think that here we need to pay much more attention to the interplay between these two areas of law. When it comes to dark patterns, the same thing. Um, how these companies have been obtaining consent most of the time have been through the use of their patterns and design interface uh, to make consumers take certain decisions that are in benefit of, of, of the platform in question. For example, continue sharing data or, or make it more difficult to, um, to change the default configurations. Great. I, I, I think that, that kind of, Amelia, that, that connects to, to, I think, one, one of your pet issues, which is, is interaction of different policies, especially consumer and, and, and competition policy. Um, and I think there are two aspects of that. One is kind of the one making the other potentially more effective. And I think we've already heard um, some arguments in that direction. Uh, the other one um, that uh, Augustine just kind of mentioned, which was, you know, you sometimes address an issue with one or the other policy. And the question there is, and maybe you can, can say on that issue also a little bit, um, is that always the right thing? Because of course the enforcement instruments are sometimes very different. Um, so for example, my question is always about Facebook. Uh, if your enforcement instrument is that you have to give choice between different privacy regimes and because of bounded rationality, you can't compare them. You haven't really solved the privacy issue through the competition policy, for example. So, so I think, is that also something we have to be aware of, uh, just uh, both the substitutability, but also where it's actually dangerous to try uh, to substitute? I mean, maybe both of those questions, one kind of the, the complementarity between those, but the other one really the substitutability, I think that's, that's how I might want to frame that yeah. question. So I, I think it's, it's really interesting because I think even the substitutability is to some extent, extent complementarity in that I think that there tend to be slight gaps in regimes that then other regimes can potentially help address and actually that then informs the development of the other regime. So actually, I think maybe the face, I don't know whether GDPR would have been exactly the same had it, be, had it not been for the Facebook case in Germany. But clearly the Facebook case in Germany started when GDPR wasn't in place, but when there was a lot of debate about whether GDPR should happen. And I suspect actually, yes, there's subs there were substitute instruments to some extent, but there's a little bit of complementarity there as well. Likewise, and at the moment, one of the issues that the CMA has highlighted around consents is that, yes, there's a, and, and really this was mentioned earlier, is, is there's a whole bunch of, you know, we, we have to keep clicking, um, but the way in which consents are put to us 
basically makes us just click and not and and it's usually a kind of all or nothing decision uh there's really no choice um on offer and even if there is a choice we're kind of led to not take it um and just click and we become very click happy and actually gdpr itself doesn't necessarily help with that i mean unless you get into unless in enforcing gdpr you really start thinking very hard about behavioral economics and informed consent but actually you can start thinking about that a little bit um with some uh, around consumer law and, and how choices are put in front of consumers um and actually i just wanted to advertise a bit of the paper that fiona was talking about but that she didn't talk about which was, was actually about privacy uh, consents and how they could be were well, there some proposals in that paper for how they could be made more effective because the concern is as I said every the moment we're all click happy um the the proposal is that there could be a kind of minimum privacy standard a minimum kind of you it would be about the privacy uh, holding of data and usage of data a certain minimum i'm not sure what that minimum would be and you wouldn't need to click it would just everybody abides by that and therefore if you find yourself being asked to click it means you're being asked something above and beyond the minimum and it's saying actually pay attention here because at the moment no one's paying attention and that's not a good outcome that's bad disclosure and even better, you could even have something along the lines of what Bill was talking about in the um, simplified disclosure around petrol, where you could have maybe three or four types of use of data. So privacy level one to four, maybe, and four would be kind of the least protection. I'm really giving up all my data and you can do whatever you want with it. And there may be certain times that consumers so want the product or so believe in the firm or whatever that they're willing to go to you know privacy for a lot of the time they're just going to go for privacy one if they're just kind of going onto a site quickly and they don't really care very much about it uh, but at least if you if if you had these levels that people could come to understand they could make more informed choices about them and clearly this is delicate and i've said already that disclosures are tricky because consumers struggle with these sorts of decisions but equally, we know that this is a very intractable pro problem and there may be some way if we do enough testing and enough careful design to enable consumers to make these decisions more effectively. Clearly, we're not in the right place at the moment. All right. I, I, for, for me, there, there, there are loads of questions that are coming up, like uh, uh, the, the question about, you know, in, in terms of attention as well. I mean, Maybe our preference is not always to have to pay attention, right? And maybe we need to design things for that. Um, but let me kind of go on in kind of in in terms of the some of the topics and, and get to some of the bit more concrete things and a bit more in depth. Um, and and I wanted to come back to this topic about fake news, social social media, and responsibility uh, that Jonathan had had first raised and and maybe do this with an initial question to George. Um, so um, I think there are arguments these days that gatekeepers should have responsibilities to resolve these issues. Um, so why should it be a gatekeeper responsibility? I think that was Jonathan's question that came up at the beginning. Um, is it actually maybe even unfair to basically say, I, I'll give you that responsibility, um, can go ahead <laughs> and uh, then afterwards you say, but that's that's outrageous what you're doing. And, and we're actually seeing this in the US that reactions are very different in different directions. Um, so is there re regulatory responsibility here that we should be setting standards? So, 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 so what's, what's your view on this? Because we're, we're essentially, I mean, we have these investigations starting that say, well, let's look at whether these firms have behaved responsibly. And it's of course really, really hard to know uh, what the public or also regulators are going to think. What is behaving responsibly, right? Um, what's your view, kind of, on this? How do we deal with this? Who who's actually got the responsibility to set the rule, uh, set the rules here? Well, we certainly think that consumer law already takes you quite a long way in terms of defining some key responsibilities on platforms. 
but we've also made clear that there are some areas which we think still need to be clarified and particular in the recommendations from the CMA's digital task force we recommended strongly that a, that, a, that a duty of care be incorporated within the consumer protection regs to put some of these matters entirely beyond doubt but coming back to where things stand now I mean it's absolutely clear that in their own rights platforms need to comply with consumer law they need to refrain from behavior that is itself misleading aggressive or um, uh, exerts undue influence on the people who use their platforms mm -hmm. and it's clear that the requirements of professional diligence require a lot of them recognizing that in certain uh, particular contexts they are uniquely placed to do certain things um, and we have taken action directly involving platforms you mentioned sort of fake reviews and social media influencers and that's few sort of examples that I'd just like to sort of draw out briefly. In particular, our attempts to tackle the, the trading of fake reviews, people who are offering freely to sell you a five star review for Amazon or Google or wherever it appeared, but using platforms like eBay, uh, Facebook and Instagram to do that. Now, from an enforcer's perspective, attempting to track down an each individual person who has created a username specifically to foster a group discussion uh, is uh, an entirely fruitless endeavor, really. Those people will phoenix, you'll never catch them. Uh, they may not be uh, possible to track down within the jurisdiction in any event. But what those people are doing is fundamentally um, against the terms of use of those platforms in its own right. And indeed, all of those platforms that I've mentioned uh, explicitly outlaw that behavior. Uh, and part of our action is doing no more than getting them to act on the things that they say they are against. Uh, and it's why we've agreed commitments why with all three of those platforms that I mentioned that they will suppress that activity. And as I say, I think they are uniquely placed to do that and to bring about that change and to, and to stem the flow of fake reviews that are going from those uh, sites onto other, uh, uh, onto other platforms. Turning to sort of social media endorsements, we're not saying in that context that platforms like uh, Instagram and others bear the only responsibility for dealing with unlabeled endorsements. But again, there are many things that they are uniquely placed to do. They are the ones who control how many people, for instance, can access the paid for partnership tool, which prompts the wrappers and the, the specific disclosures that make it clearest uh, to members of the public that there is a paid for relationship going on and we agreed specific undertakings with Instagram at the end of last year which makes uh, all of the elements of that responsibility clear some of it turns on the, the role that the platform itself has in being upfront about being a platform where there's a lot of advertising and that people should expect to see a lot of advertising when they go on Instagram but another part of it is actually to use the tools at their disposal, like prompts and automatic triggers, when someone looks like they're posting something that's quite clearly an ad, to give them the tools to properly label it and disclose it and to make sure that the public can weigh that information properly as an, as an ad. So um, we, we think already within the tools that we have within consumer law, there's a lot that, uh, that bears down on platforms and their responsibility as gatekeepers. Uh, but as I said, there's other aspects of it where we are we're keen to see some some further movement from uh, from government in, in in tightening the rules. So it seems to me, I mean, you're talking about advertising, which is which is really, you know, we know it's interested speech and and kind of informing people about that that exists uh, seems to be very effective, and, and and we've done that for a long time. I mean, the, the, the rules on on labeling of advertisement also on the internet go into really really early times. For example, of Google, uh, where the FTC has has created rules like this. But I, I wanted to go, go back to Jonathan because, you know, if we're thinking about fake fake news and the different reactions, for example, in Europe and, and the US to, to kind of bans on Twitter and so on and so forth, it seems to be all about how do we enforce something that's disinformation or bad quality information and the, the uneasiness about whether it's banned or not or who bans is that a matter that we're not quite sure? I mean, very often we're making statements that are not quite true, that are a bit misleading, they might not be intentionally misleading, uh, 
some of them are. Um, doesn't the uneasiness come from us not being quite sure where those standards are? And, and where do we need to go uh, to create those types of standards so that they seem fair uh, to a broader range of people, right? Because that, that seems to be where the, where the discussion comes from. If I'm thinking about fake, fake news or, or things like this or, or uh, Twitter bans. Well, pursuing my earlier point about not ignoring the past, I mean, we are still arguing about the printing press. Uh, ever since uh, we started uh, print and literacy uh, expanded, we have been arguing lawyers, economists, politicians, regulators about the extent to which uh, the state should regulate uh, what is printed and distributed and how, uh, and what decisions should be made by politicians, judges, and individual publishers and writers and all the rest of it. Now, uh, given the uh, uh, centuries, at least decades of widespread literacy now behind us, I suppose some sort of consensus and equilibrium uh, uh, have been met, found, uh, and uh, social media present a whole bunch of new challenges, uh, which uh, uh, all the precedents about uh, uh, print don't always help it. Uh, so uh, we need some fresh thinking. Uh, we need to understand, and that's where the behavioral scientists need to help us, I think. We need to understand how people react, uh, why disclosure of information, caveat emptor, don't seem to be enough. And we need to find some consensus because these are all far more than uh, printed books, uh, all this stuff is very difficult to censor. I would say, fortunately, some would regret it, uh, and uh, uh, is fairly widespread across the whole world. So we need to have some consensus, very difficult though it is to find, about the respective roles of the state and what you leave uh, in the hands of the individual companies, uh, which are, uh, are given or have uh, acquired considerable responsibility. The gatekeeper is the obvious uh, uh, current characterization. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Um, it's, it's a much bigger field than traditional competition policy. Uh, it's a much bigger field even, I think, than old fashioned competition policy plus unfair competition plus uh, other sorts of uh, regulatory standards. Um, and it is inevitably international, certainly within Europe, within the European Union, but in fact, uh, way beyond the European Union uh, uh, as well, because of the ubiquity of the, uh, uh, of the, um, the platforms and the services they provide. So um, we are sort of legislating, regulating uh, in a bit of a hurry. Um, I understand the need to move quickly because of the concerns, because of the, uh, uh, the effect on, uh, on children, because of the effect on democratic processes, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, events like this, I think are very important because they do help uh, bring about a, uh, 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 a wider discussion. Uh, somebody was saying, I think it was Grant, that economists are uh, learning humility. Well, we all have to be humble in the face of this. Uh, it's, uh, it's a new, we are sort of uh, living in the time of Gutenberg. We are uh, facing uh, the consequences of a new technology still in its infancy. Uh, and at least among the democracies of the world, uh, trying to find the best way to use what's good in it and uh, regulate what needs to be regulated uh, and, and find the necessary balances between individual responsibility or corporate responsibility and state responsibility. So I'm, I'm afraid I'm restating the problem rather than uh, offering easy solutions, but I don't think anybody who does offer easy solutions should be believed at this stage. But we need a lot more conversation uh, uh, of this sort uh, 
between all the various disciplines involved uh, to, uh, to find a way forward. Augustine, I, I believe you've had, um, you, you've recently written on this, right? On, on uh, gatekeeper responsibility. So what's your perspective on this? Um, where should the focus lie there? Yeah, I, I like to start, um, you started with your, with your question about um, how to assess when a company behave responsibly. And this is all about basically, as a lawyer, of having the right benchmarks to assess that. Um, when we look at um, and the platforms, kind of forget there is some um, a relationship between the platform and the consumer, uh, and then also the users of that platform or the traders of that platform vis-a-vis -vis the consumer. And consumer law, for example, have been focusing um, a lot in the relationship between the trader and the consumer. A platform can be a trader in the relation to the service that is providing to the consumer. Um, and also the traders that are within the platform also vis-a-vis -vis the consumer. And what is really interesting is that when we look at what should be the benchmark then for the platform, then we enter into a discussion in which, unfortunately, we put everything kind of in the same basket. So we talk about regulation of uh, free speech, as well as um, how to address um, unsafe products or fake reviews. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's, um, that's a problem in itself because this platform raises different types of concerns which require different types of solutions. So of course, I'm not qualified to talk about regulation of free speech, I'm not a free speech lawyer, so I'm, 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 I'm far from um, pretending that, that, that the platform you know, should decide who can say what uh, and, 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 and as you know, the regulation of free speech has been an extremely sensitive issue um, for, for, for ages. <laughs> if you see the standards in Germany are pretty different from, uh, from, from the UK or, or France or, or Belgium, Spain. So this is also a very, very, very close to the identity of, 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 uh, of the history of, of each country. Um, but when we look at it really from the point of view of the relationship between the platform and the consumer, for example, regarding e-commerce. And, and here we look at the, for example, the great job that the, the CMA is doing on fake reviews, um, but as well on, on, on how to tackle um, the issue of um, unsafe, unsafe products. And, and here is where we have a missing benchmark. Um, the, for example, the fair commercial practice legislation um, provides that you know, companies need to um, um, respect the, the duty of due diligence or professional diligence, which is a standard in, in itself. Um, but from our perspective, it kind of falls short in order to create kind of the legislative you know, or the regulatory incentive for the companies to really act. Um, because at the end, how you define the professional diligence really um, uh, is, is, is can be quite sub subjective. Of course, you can make the companies, and certainly George can talk more about that, to at least ensure that their own rules are respected vis-a-vis -vis its, uh, its, its, its users. Um, but I think that the discussion goes a bit, um, be, you can go beyond that in, in attributing the responsibilities in the law that each of the platform will have in relation to the specific role that they play vis-a-vis -vis the consumers and its users. So for example, when it comes to e-commerce platforms, um, when the platform has a predominant role over the shopping experience of the consumer, like Amazon, for example, I think that they should be simply liable towards the consumer if something goes wrong in the with the purchasing process or if the product that they bought is is, is unsafe and cause a harm because all the wealth for the consumer will seem extremely difficult to find uh, who is the, the trader especially if the trader for example comes from uh, outside the EU okay thanks very much for that um, let me kind of move and I, and I think it, it fits quite well so we're we're talking about the responsibility of the uh, of platforms maybe for for activities of others on there, but there's also just kind of the responsibility for uh, the, the issues about, you know, how these are these are run. And, and Amelia, I wanted to bring you in on this now, kind of this general topic of dark patterns that is, um, you know, how does choice architecture exploit behavioral patterns? And, and, and what do we see? How large are the impacts that we know about? What can you tell us about that? Where, where, where are we with this? And um, where do you see uh, regulatory intervention going in that area? So Fiona already talked about um, dark patterns, choice architecture, which is basically dark patterns, uh, choice architecture online um, and behavioral biases and actually how it plays into consumer policy and also competition policy. And in fact, some of the 
best evidence that we've got has been from competition policy cases like the Google Android case, um, partly because you know the stakes are high in those cases and lots of evidence kind of comes out of the woodwork. Um, and we do see you know incredibly strong uh, default effects, at least in the short term. I mean, yesterday we had a brilliant talk um, from um, David Labson, um, which where he said that the proximate uh, effects of defaults are maybe sometimes less, well, often less than the long-term effects of defaults. I think that is a really interesting point, and we probably need to bring it over to when we're thinking about the behavior of firms in terms of cho choice architecture as well. But certainly there is growing evidence that choice architecture online, at least proximately, and often that's what matters because the purchase is made, um, change consumer uh, behavior. Um, and, you know, I won't go into lots of examples, but there are plenty of examples from, you know, uh, Fiona put up a slide where the key terms were in very pale, tiny print at the very bottom of the page. I mean, it doesn't take a huge behavioral experiment to deduce that that is going to lead to bad, bad consumer decision making. That's like extreme dark pattern. Um, what's more interesting is the subtler dark patterns where you're not really quite sure where the line should be. So for example, to make a comparison, um, there are two, uh, in terms of selling Amazon Prime, which is another example that Fiona mentioned, um, often when you try, when you're buying an Amazon thing, um, uh, you basically, and you're not on Prime, you get uh, to the end of the thing and then there's lots and lots of pictures of lovely boxes. And in order not to buy Amazon Prime, you have to scroll down to a little uh, worded thing saying, no, I, I really don't want to have um, free delivery, one day delivery and all these things. It very, it's, it's kind of doesn't sound very appealing, but at least, you know, it's there. I think it's understandable, but, you know, so, so, so that is, currently there and, and no one, unless George corrects me, is taking action against it. However, Amazon did another thing that the ASA did say was inappropriate and told Amazon they had to stop, where they had a similar, on the, at the same point in the process, there were two buttons you could press. And one of them said, yes, I would like Amazon Prime. And the other one said, yes, I would like free next day delivery. Um, and then quite a lot far away on the page was the actual only place you could say, no, I don't want Amazon Prime. And of course, what happened is lots and lots of people, including me, because I remember this and I fell for it, um, clicked on the no, the, the box they thought was no, but was in fact yes, not spotting that the only no was really hard to see. And the ASA quite rightly said, this is inappropriate, but they have, so I think that, and that's a clear dark pattern. I think what's interesting is no one has opined on the current position where you have to scale down and there's the, this, just this one way of saying no. Is that because that's a, 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 on the other side of the line? Maybe, but how, what's that tell us about exactly where the line is, about what we care about and what we don't care about? And I think actually the only way of discovering where that line is, is the empirical, you need to basically go and see how consumers are reacting to um, these sorts of dark patterns and whether they, and they wouldn't be used if they didn't have an effect. So you can't just look at whether they have an effect. You have to kind of look at whether they have an effect that the consumer is, un <laughs> is unhappy about somehow, um, which is not straightforward, but I do think that's what we have to do. Can I come in just for a second and, and just make a comment that, yes. Yeah. You know, I think that that's the exciting thing, as I said, for economists and for, uh, it's not only economists, we have to work with a number of other disciplines as well in trying to think through. The question really, I think, is going to be, you know, what sort of scale and activity can be expected of the regulator, of George and his team? Um, because to monitor this on a continuous basis is absolutely huge. And you just have to look to financial services to see, you know, dealing with big banks, international, multinational banks operating in lots of areas, the scale of financial regulation is absolutely massive. And it would be interesting to actually get your feedback, George, on how much you're expecting to see the CMA step into that space uh, and do the monitoring and the work versus the other parts of the system that could be doing the work. I mean, there are parts of the system that we could be looking to that are 
more along private enforcement and the sort of compensation stuff, or on the education side, you know, whether, you know, the CMA is working very closely with the Department for Education on exactly what people are taught about how to understand these biases through, through schooling. So I just wanted to say, we're talking a lot about scale and the, the scale is, is absolutely huge. It would be interesting to know where George thinks the practical uh, limits of the CMA's ambition have to be. I think, let me, let me pull that together because there's an interesting contrast between what you just said and, and the, the other part that Emilia said, which I completely agree with. In the end, it's really an empirical question. And, and you know, I've, I've, I've actually worked with some of, some of that type of data. And sometimes, sometimes you have astonishing effects that then have no negative consumer impact, right? Where you think they would have, and, and maybe another. So, so it is from that point of view, an empirical question. There are just so many things <laughs> that could happen is what Grant says that you know do you do you constant do you constant monitoring and and you know you can you can um, employ leagues of economists in doing that. So George, I think that question was directly to you. How on earth are we going to handle this? And I think the question is also phrased as how ambitious are you? And we're hugely yeah. ambitious, Grant. So I'd like <laughs> to uh, stress that. And I suppose. I mean, one of the ways that we go into this, not least because the steer to the CMA from government, is we should try and address practices that become systemic across a market or sector. And we work through sectors and in particular try and tackle sludge uh, around auto renewal processes, sort of most recently with our outcomes on antivirus software providers, where the undertakings of what we've agreed were published a, a few weeks ago but where we can also work in partnership with others to try and get the message out and if necessary, tighten uh, the sort of the parameters of sector regulation is sort of a good example of that is our work in the gambling sector uh, where there were tons of issues around sort of the, the, the ease with which people could get out of entry promotions would find themselves effectively locked uh, in, in the terms of wagering uh, that, 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 that they had signed up to. Uh, we said what we thought, the Gambling Commission weighed in behind that and then made it a new license condition uh, uh, to make sure that the rules of the road were changed for all. But you're right, Grant, it's a huge task. And, you know, staying on top of the entire uh, online choice architecture for every um, retailer and e-commerce platform and the like is, is, is a big job. Uh, and one of the most effective ways, I think, actually, that we can enforce that is through our international partnerships. Um, and there is a good, strong network of international consumer protection enforcers. We've just had our uh, annual conference this week and a real determination to try and do things efficiently and effectively together, recognizing that if one of us is able to achieve an outcome to tackle aspects of the dark nudge and sort of uh, and harmful online choice architecture, um, we can back each other up, we can reinforce each other's outcomes and try and get the same protections for our own citizens. And we can go in jointly on certain matters we can try and enforce together. And there were some examples of that uh, coordination where the UK, the Dutch and the Norwegian authorities all uh, took on uh, Google and Apple in connection with the disclosure of key privacy information before people download apps. So um, I think there is a huge power in that and an efficiency um, uh, and a risk in the other direction if all of us go in with our own separate asks uh, of, uh, uh, of online retailers and, uh, and platforms in particular. If I, if I can right. um, add yeah. something on that very, very briefly, I would also add also considering the, the, the role of um, more prescriptive regulation in this regard. So for example, taking the example, um, the case that I, I, Amalia mentioned, um, in Germany, there is now a um, proposal for, um, for a law on um, fair um, contracting uh, in, in, in consumer contract basically is um, requesting to also introduce, like you have the accept button to introduce a cancellation button and make it visible to the, to the consumer. So basically inter, in, interfering and, 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 and mandating a specific form of um, of choice architecture, but what I found really interesting, especially when I when I hear you know George and, and, and the colleagues from enforcement authorities, um, what they are considered actually to use to identify this dark pattern, the same techniques that these companies are using with us as consumers. We are all being part of a huge experiment, uh, 
if you think about that, we might not know that when interacting with all these platforms, they have been applying A-B testing to identify how do we react to certain things. So we have been all part of a huge experiment and they try to optimize the choice architecture in their benefit. And then enforcement authorities will try to identify how this company have identified the best way to <laughs> nudge us to towards certain decisions. So I think that here we can we ended up in a situation like you know dog and a cat trying to help each other. That's why I think that in some circumstances, you know, the the intervention of the regulator in the way the choice, the choice architecture should be designed is extremely important. I think I just emphasise that I think what we can see from what's been happening on information disclosure and that is is that sometimes you have to use a different approach every single time because what might have an effect for one group just doesn't in, in others. Uh, as I said, I think some of the FCA's disclosures on the interventions they've made that didn't turn out in the way that they would have expected are really useful there because they're often trying to pick up the same uh, intervention and, and lift it into a different part of the financial services market and getting a completely different result. And some of them, are impossible to predict. I, I, I've always uh, smiled at uh, you know, disclosing um, the compensation to a particular agent can sometimes end up having the person make the wrong decision, basing their decision on the commission getting paid to the agent. Putting the word annuity into a, a letter can discourage people from buying an annuity. Um, and that's the part that I think is such a big challenge for George and, and the international regulatory network. Is, is how to you know, also communicate all these things that clearly don't work. Grant, Grant let, me, let me pick up on this because I think this is, a, this is we had in kind of a pre-discussion, you essentially has, had said, well, um, let's bring judges into this as well. Um, isn't damages litigation a good instrument here that would be complementing what, what regulators, uh, regulators do? Um, is that a good instrument? Does it give us better, better standards or is it a good instrument because it's very individualized? I mean, what, what, what's your thinking about the role specifically in this area of damages litigation? Um, um, if you from, from my side, you know, uh, I was just talking about it as part of the framework. I often think that the court system is forgotten. Uh, a lot of energy is put onto whether the enforcers have sufficient resources, but actually a lot of things end up going through the court system, either in private enforcement or follow on actions. Um, and, and the court system in the UK, I think, uh, you know, works really well with the CAT, but it, it is under pressure with the amount of volumes that's coming through. And, and ultimately, you do want consumers, if there was harm and if there was abuse, to be put back together, to be made whole through compensation. That's the idea. And so that system does need to work unless George and, and team are going to design, in each case, some sort of redress program and run that redress program as well, uh, as, as happened with PPI, for example. Um, and, and, you know, the other side of it is, Kayuva, is, is obviously... Um, not obviously, but I, I do think that the the uh, the fear of facing class action litigation, for example, may be a disciplining effect on some of the bigger players who think to themselves, "Gosh, you know, if we are found to have knowingly done something wrong, we're going to face class litigation," and that's taking off slowly in the UK in the competition space, but still there have been no you know, classes certified uh, here in the UK more than six years after the regime was set up to do it. So it's a place where, you know, more focus, I think, would be worthwhile, both for the uh, effect it will have on companies to sort of sharpen their, their focus, but also just to take some of the pressure, frankly, off uh, the, the front end, the enforcement side. Let me ask me a follow-up question on this because because it's uh, because there's there's an interesting analogy to, to competition policy where actually to have a deterrent effect it has, has to be really clear what the bad actions are and I think in some of the follow-on litigation that we've had um, in something like uh, you know Mastercard and Visa we've kind of got a mess of different decisions 
essentially because it wasn't even quite clear when and what actually would be an abuse. And, and it always felt to me that it was, that this was something that you wanted to fix through regulation, but where, um, you know, the exposed litigation was somehow strange because ex ante, no one actually knew what the right regime would have been. <laughs> Right? And, we're, and we're, we're still, it's, I mean, the counterfactual of every, every judge is different in these things. It, should we learn from that and basically say, if we actually want to have effective um, uh, damages litigations, we, we actually have to create a very clear framework for that? What is actually abusive in this, in this context? Well, I would agree. I think that, you know, I, I'm, I, I think it would definitely help. I, I think that the challenge, as I said in my opening comments, you know, even on relatively simple things, it's difficult to sometimes prove the effect of it. Um, you know, things that are known per se to be bad for consumers, cartels, for example. Um, it's certainly difficult on discriminatory actions because, um, and then in a number of these spaces, there's the dynamic effects. Things may happen for a very short period of time and somebody might uh, at the end of it, you know, learn or do something different or a new competitor might come along. So uh, I'm sort of not underestimating that I think that the damages system is challenging. It's just, I think, an important part of the system if you want to protect consumers and put them back together at the end of facing an abuse. So, so Augustine, maybe, maybe, maybe picking up on that, uh, do you see kind of the, the collective, um, collective redress uh, in that framework as an opportunity also for uh, consumer organizations uh, to, to push? Or, or do you see that as a secondary instrument? Happy, happy to answer that. I think Jonathan was with his hand already for, for a while. So I don't know, Jonathan, if you want to come in first. Sure. Oh, well, that's very kind, thanks. I, I just wanted to say two things, in fact. One, and I'll be quick. One is that law, law and lawyers and judges can be creative. Uh, it takes time, but don't forget the law of tort in common law was invented by judges essentially because the law of contract simply wasn't working. The, there were harms arising uh, between people uh, uh, where there was no contractual nexus. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, unless, unless tort was invented, nobody would have been held responsible. But do we have time for that relatively long leisurely legal development to take place? I guess not. And on the ex-ante, uh, legal certainty point, people need to know uh, how to plan their businesses, uh, what insurance they need, insurers need to know, consumers need to know, producers need to know. So uh, it, it's not enough, I think, simply to uh, stand back and let the judges sort it out. They would, but they'd probably take 40, 50 years uh, to do it. Uh, and, and that would it will take 40, 50 years in the common law jurisdictions. In civil law jurisdictions, I think the, uh, uh, the authorities simply wouldn't put up with it for very long uh, and, and would intervene uh, pretty quickly. If I, actually, I forget my second point, happy to stop. If you remember it, just, just <laughs> point it out. Actually, I was in both the, the, the comment of, of, of Jonathan and, and, and your question about um, litigation and collective redress. I do think, and actually we have seen um, the court or the role of the courts in basically guiding at the end of the day the, um, the legislator. Competition law has been extremely important, but also in consumer law. So for example, um, the unfair contract terms directive, directive of you know mid-90s, had been an extremely important instrument during the financial crisis and had been used um, a lot. And we could see that through um, preliminary judgments of the, of the Court of Justice of the EU about the application of the um, uh, unfair, um, unfairness control mechanism of this, of this directive in, um, in mortgage contracts, for example, um, to the point that it has even um, uh, provided um, 
benchmarks of intervention regarding procedural law, which is an area that has not been harmonized at, uh, at, at the EU level, and, and member states are, 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 are very, very careful of um, uh, preventing that this is that there is further harmonization in this in, the, in this field. So I think that um, litigation plays still a very important role. Um, consumer litigation, collective redress as well. Why? Because we have um, a lot of cases, consumer cases generally, out of a small amount, but this can impact a big amount of people. So individually, this these folks will not go to go to court, and sometimes even ADR or all the artists is not not effective enough. But through collective redress, actually, you can create a mechanism on one side to um, dissuade or discourage companies to engage on certain practices, even if it's going to be for a small amount, because you will have the opportunity actually to go to court uh, in, in an um, opt-out um, uh, proceeding. Um, so I think that here it can play a, a dual role on one side to um, uh, ensure that, 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 that actually companies comply with the law on the other side and um, achieve redress for, for consumers, which is, again, one of the biggest limitations of, of the current consumer protection uh, system. All right, very good. Um, any other comment on this topic at this point? Uh, yes, George. Uh, just trying to just briefly distinguish a bit between the sort of the follow on action uh, opt out collective claims mechanism in the cat for, for competition law and and what would be ideal for sort of for mass sort of consumer law issues and obviously the government in the UK has announced that they're intending to sort of redesign some aspects of, of, of public enforcement and we wait to see what they will come forward specifically but I think there's a real opportunity to do something uh, there in the design of a of, of the public enforcement regime that, that that lightens the load and and reduces the direct pressure on uh, on claimants because quite a lot has to have happened to engineer a kind of a class action or a group claim of, of that scale and uh, inevitably many years pass by while that takes place if a public enforcement regime can be designed in such a way to really strongly incentivize redress and making consumers whole again that has such power and there's a much greater opportunity I'd argue in consumer law matters to deal with the whole problem competition law claims are rife with issues about uh, direct and indirect part purchases and passing on and the like more often in consumer matters you can deal with the whole problem uh, and indeed some of our ECMs the enhanced consumer measures that the CMAs secured in the past year have tried to deal with the totality of the problem uh, but uh, the design of the public enforcement mechanism has got to provide very strong incentives for parties to come forward and try and fix uh, uh, as much of it, if not all of it, uh, uh, as they can. Yes, um, we just had a common question coming in, which was, which maybe someone might might want to take on this, which is um, was on the issue of funding these types of collective collective action points. I don't know whether someone wants wants to comment on those, um, but it it seems it seems again some some of the thoughts on these have been that that. Some of that coordination could be could be done by by consumer associations or or, or have, have them run these, these things. There, there, there are lots of models out there. Um, so 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 how do how do we make something like that effective? Because the funding issue tends to be a big one. I even even in competition uh, litigation. Amelia is nodding. Do you have something to anybody has something to add to that? I, I, I actually was nodding in, in agreement that it's an issue. I would just highlight that quite a lot of the kind of more dark patterny type um, consumer harms, the, the consumer harm is less kind of easy to uh, quantify. And actually often the harm is in fact about how well the market works. Sure more generally, and actually we want consumer policy that is effective so that markets work well for all consumers. Um, but, um, and then therefore there's a huge, a huge externality um, uh, from, from, from uh, consumer, any consumer bringing a case, but actually any individual example of consumer harm, or even a set of, in, even if you add those all up, but only look at the direct harm of, you know, 
buying this product instead of that product is really, really hard to quantify and really, really hard to bring a case. So I would, I, I, I think it's really important to have um, private action, but I would be really worried if um, there was too much focus on private action, because I think that, um, you know, the work that the CMA does in setting standards um, and really driving these areas where actually it's hard to quantify the harm is, is, is incredibly important. All right. We are hitting exactly the end of the allocated time slot, I think. Um, so uh, first of all, I would, would really like to thank all of the panelists for, for, for a very interesting and, and varied kind of discussion across a broad range of, of topics. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for that and participating in this. Uh, let me also kind of just um, take the opportunity to basically um, close the conference here, uh, thanking again all of the participants, all of the speakers who've uh, shared um, <clears throat> all very interesting um, insights. Um, I, I think when we were uh, discussing setting something up, uh, up on consumer uh, policy, we were all kind of worried, does our uh, competition audience actually appreciate that this is, is something that we should uh, should be doing. I think in terms of the participation, we've seen um, that uh, this is for a broad audience and I see it saw a lot of competition uh, interested people in there as well. Um, this has kind of come through as being a really important regulatory um, uh, area, uh, also for people interested in competition. I, I think the uh, interaction of these areas is becoming more and more uh, obvious also in terms of the legislation that we're seeing. And so I think we chose uh, once again a topic uh, that was coming at exactly the right time uh, with a slightly different angle to maybe what others are, were discussing, but a really important topic. Again, thanks again very much to all of the speakers that we've had here. Thank you to the audience for uh, staying for uh, what was uh, still a relatively long session on the internet. And we hope that next year our conference can be at least in part in person again. Um, which uh, would be nice because um, part of the experience are also the private conversations uh, that one can have afterwards, which we're still missing. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this was a great event. Uh, thanks to all of you uh, participating. Thank you very much and uh, we hope to see you next year.